नमस्कार सत्याकाल आदाब गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून एंड गुड इवनिंग जहां से भी आप हमें सुन रहे हैं थैंक यू फॉर ज्वाइनिंग आर फेसबुक लाइव सेशन माय नेम इज कुंजन मवार आई एम योर होस्ट एंड दोस फॉर टुडेज एफपी लाइव सेशन दीज आर अनप्रेसिडेंटेड एंड अनप्रेडिक्टेबल टाइम्स टेल मी समथिंग डिड यू एवर थॉट इट्स पॉसिबल टू हैव द मोस्ट एक्सपीरियंस हाईली क्वालिफाइड कंपैशनेट डॉक्टर्स एट द क्लिक क्लिक ऑफ अ बटन well e global doctors is the answer with affordable secure web application online healthcare remote consultation membership options personalized health passport and many more in today's facebook live session we will be exploring and providing more information about omicron and vaccination doubts in conversation with dr anup katyal dr katyal doesn't need a introduction he is an icu critical care expert board certified in five specialties internal medicine sleep medicine critical care medicine neuro critical care medicine with over 25 years of experience it's so nice to meet you virtually again dr katyal thank you for sparing time i know you're super duper busy welcome to fb life and happy new year same to you and thanks for having me back Thank you. And how are you doing this evening, Doctor Katyal? I'm doing okay. Thank you. Uh, I am super excited. I hope you are ready. I have so many questions in my head, which are bubbling with this new variant which we have. So, um, what makes Omicron a big concern? Like we have heard so many names in the past. one year there are so many mutation does it mean that every time there is a new mutation it's more severe than the other so the reason uh, omicron is of concern is because it's a highly transmissible virus uh, that's the main concern and uh, you know it is 3 to 4 times more transmissible than delta virus and we are all aware of what delta virus uh, caused you know it caused havoc because it was very transmissible so that is the main cause for concern uh, having said that you know you mentioned that each time you uh, you know hear of a mutation or see a mutation is this going to be more serious than the previous one that may not necessarily be true but certainly the main concern with omicron is it's a highly transmissible virus and the other thing i would point out is that you know when we looked at the original Uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection the incubation period was about 5 days when we had the delta virus incubation period was about 4 days and for omicron uh, the variant it is 3 days so it is actually rapid so if if somebody catches omicron they should be able to find out sooner um compared to the other variants that is true the incubation period tells you on an average you know how long does it take for the symptoms to show up but having said that sure. we are also seeing a fair amount of infections that are asymptomatic with omicron got it so you said it's highly trans transferable that's the word you use transmissible transmissible so give give me some examples like so like when i say I... highly transmissible uh, we have seen you know what is called as a doubling time that if you start with certain number of infections you know it dub doubling time is only 2 to 3 days so that tells you you know how transmissible uh, this uh, variant is and that's why you're seeing you know previously when we used to see an increase in number whether it was you know alpha uh, beta gamma delta Uh, the peak was somewhat you know slow and it went up you can see uh, the rise in omicron cases whether it is you know what we originally saw in south africa then subsequently in uk and europe and now in united states and even now in india like we hear in delhi and mumbai you know the cases are rising exponentially that just tells you you know how transmissible this virus is got it so you mentioned that delta uh, was highly uh, transmissible and this is even um, faster so so that is one difference what is the difference between delta and omicron so the difference you know uh, between the two is that uh, this omicron virus has 50 plus mutations so 30 plus on the spike protein itself 
and there are 20 other mutations. So that is one cause for concern. The second difference uh, that I would point out is the symptoms that patients are presenting with. So the main uh, symptoms that uh, patients with Omicron are presenting with are headache, running nose, sneezing, sore throat, and fatigue. If you recall, when we had the original COVID and subsequent Delta, high fevers, loss of taste, loss of smell, uh, that was uh, very important, you know, uh, as uh, a manifestation of, uh, you know, Delta infection. But that is not what we are seeing with Omicron. Uh, the other thing is because it has so many mutations, it has the capability of escaping prior immunity and the vaccinations uh, that are currently available. So those are the main differences, more transmissible, shorter incubation period, symptoms are slightly different than what we saw with Omicron. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, the tendency for immune escape. And one more difference I would point out is that as we can discuss subsequently, Omicron for some reason uh, tends to affect the upper airway and not the lower airway. So the main concern with the you know, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 is that you get respiratory failure, that the lower airway is affected. So somehow with Omicron, you know, usually, as I mentioned, this running nose, sneezing, sore throat, uh, people are not requiring you know, oxygen supplementation, hospitalization, ICU. So that's uh, something that we are seeing with Omicron. Okay. Um... That's a lot of information uh, for uh, someone like me to digress. So um, I'm gonna go back. You did touch a little bit about the symptoms, but I'm gonna ask the, the question again. Um, so everybody else, whoever is joining us and listening to us through Facebook Live. So what are the symptoms in particular, uh, which, which we will see in Omicron variant that we did not see with the prior COVID uh, variants? Like I said, you know, the running nose, sneezing, headache, sore throat, backache, these are the main five symptoms you'll see with Omicron. You will not see loss of taste, loss of smell. You will not see high fevers. And some of the other things that just came out, it's yet not published, is, you know, data from Case Western here in the United States. And three other things that they noticed was patients who presented with Omicron had some nausea, back pain, and night sweats. Uh, they are not able to explain why. But those are the other three things uh, commonly patients with Omicron presented in addition to the five symptoms I mentioned. So that okay. is something so, that helps distinguish, you know, uh, the two infections. Okay, so no chills, like no, no chills if, if they get fever or? Yeah, in general, you don't see it. I will not say it's an absolute, but you still okay. can have Omicron with fever. But in general, those are the symptoms like an upper respiratory infection uh, kind of symptoms we are seeing with Omicron. Got it. Um, you did touch upon it. So every time we see a new variant, it's faster, it's spreading faster. Uh, the, the symptoms are different. So is Omicron variant worse than Delta? So because it is transmissible, it is affecting a lot of uh, individuals. Uh, but is it more serious than Delta? The initial data from uh, South Africa, from UK, and what we have from United States itself would suggest, like I mentioned, that Omicron tends to affect upper airway and not the, you know, the lungs per se. And that is why it is not as serious an infection. But because it is so transmissible, you will have so many people affected. And obviously, you know, people who are elderly or people with comorbid conditions will end up getting hospitalized or those who have not been vaccinated and will need ICU, but it is not as severe as what we saw with the Delta variant. And there are different theories as to why, you know, it only affects the upper airway and not the lower airways, but it is still too early to say. Too early to say, okay. So it's serious. So you heard it, everybody get vaccinated. Um, so, can the currently used diagnostic methods detect Omicron? So that's a very good question. Currently, we have two main uh, you know, tests that we use. One is called as the antigen test, which is the rapid test, which gives us the answers you know, with the, within like 30 minutes. So those tests are looking at antigenic material uh, from uh, the virus. 
and it is not as sensitive a test. So what I'm trying to say is if it is negative, you cannot be sure that you don't have the infection. So that is why if you're doing the antigen test and your suspicion is there, it may not pick up the asymptomatic infections. And also if you have to rely on the antigen test, you have to do it serially, meaning you cannot do it one day and say, that's it. Uh, you know, I'm having symptoms. I don't have Omicron. You have to do it twice, thrice, like over two, three days, you know, each day serially to be sure that you're not carrying the infection. There is some data to suggest that some of these antigen tests that we are having, as I mentioned, are not as sensitive, that they may not be picking up the Omicron variant. The other test that we have is the RT-PCR. That is the gold standard. So that test is very good for diagnosing, but when it comes time to, you know, when can we end isolation, RT-PCR is not the test because it is such a sensitive test, it picks up even the dead virus. So if your RT-PCR is positive, then you should not be repeating an RT-PCR to say, oh, I'm no longer infectious because that RT-PCR may be positive up to 12 weeks. So you cannot rely on the RT-PCR for ending the isolation. So you have to go either by symptoms or by an antigen test if it is available. Uh, to see, you know, when you can uh, be uh, ending your isolation. So if somebody was tested positive, uh, if they do the test again, within that 12 week period you mentioned, they will come, the, the test will come as positive. The RT-PCR could be positive. Now, I don't want positive. to confuse people. There is something called with the RT-PCR called a cycle threshold. Uh, that has mm -hmm. not been standardized. So sometimes you see that in the test. And if you see the RT-PCR and you see a certain cycle threshold, the higher the number, the less infectious you are. So that is one other thing you can look at, but it's not been standardized. Uh, so that is one thing. The other thing I would point out it is that people frequently ask, uh, how do you differentiate whether this is you know, Delta or Omicron? I mentioned some of the symptoms, but again, nothing is absolute. But on the RT-PCR, you know, it uh, detects several genes. Uh, one is the gene for the spike protein, one is the gene for the envelope, and one is the gene for the nucleocapsid. So when you do the RT-PCR, there is something called an S gene dropout that you don't see the S gene in the Omicron variant, which you see in the Delta variant. So that gives you a hint that probably what you're dealing with is an Omicron infection, but again, you have to confirm it with the whole genome sequencing. As I am talking to you, I just read that, you know, Tata and ICMR in India have come up with this RT-PCR kit called Omishore, which can distinguish, you know, a Delta infection versus uh, an Omicron infection. Got it. Okay, so we do have some existing vaccines that we all have been taking. So will the existing vaccines work against um, the Omicron? Um... So, uh, you know, since Omicron was first actually found out in Botswana, th then in South Africa, and now it has spread all over, we have some information. And there's a recent study out of United Kingdom, which suggested that if you had received the two doses of, uh, you know, vaccine, then there was a 52% protection against hospitalization. And if you got the booster, that's the third dose, then this protection increased to 88% against hospitalization. So because Omicron is such a transmissible virus, I don't think one should be looking at, you know, the number of cases, but the number of hospitalizations as a marker of you know, how bad the situation is. And that hospitalization aspect, you know, that is prevented by the vaccination. So the people who have received uh, you know, no vaccination should start getting the initial vaccination regimen and those who have received the two doses uh, should get their booster. I will point out that if you look in general, uh, the vaccines that are available, we have the two, uh, you know, uh, uh, mRNA vaccines here in United States called the Moderna and Pfizer. And then you have what is called as a vector vaccine, which is the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which worldwide is the Oxford AstraZeneca, which is marketed as Covishield in India. 
So that's the same vector va vaccine. So you have an mRNA vaccine, you have a vector vaccine, and then the indigenous vaccine produced in India called, you know, Covaxin. Now that's a separate vaccine because it is created from an inactivated whole virus. So there is some thought because it is created from an inactivated whole virus, the Covaxin may be more beneficial against Omicron. But again, it's the you know production concerns, et cetera, in India. And the fourth vaccine that I would like to point out is, which is being produced in Serum Institute of India uh, by a Novavax, it's called Covovax. It's, so it's a different vaccine using sort of recombinant nanoparticle technique. So those are, would be the four vaccines available. And uh, so whosoever has not been vaccinated, I would certainly say, should get vaccinated. Those who have had the initial vaccination dose should get the booster. Okay, so that's a perfect actually segue into my next question because my next question was, how effective will be booster? Uh, should people wait to take their booster or should they just go and take the booster? So depending upon wherever you are, you know, you should get the booster. So, you know, if I talk about here, uh, as you may have heard, uh, you know, here the, FDA and then CDC approved the booster dose for uh, uh, children uh, between you know, 12 and uh, 17 years just recently, uh, I mean 12 and 15. And what they mentioned was that five months after the second dose, you should get the booster. So they are decreasing that time frame between your booster, uh, between your second dose, sorry, and the booster, because you know, what we have seen is as time goes by, the neutralizing antibody, their levels drop down. So against Omicron, the data that we have from United States suggest that if you get the booster shot after the two initial shots, then the level of antibody increases 25 fold uh, when you get the booster. So that provides the additional layer of protection against Omicron with regards to its hospitalization. Got it. So booster is like a cushion to have it besides the two doses. Exactly. So, and then the okay. Johnson & Johnson was a single dose and there was a recommendation to uh, get a booster after two months, but that's pretty much fallen out of favor. If you look at it here in United States, we're dealing with the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. Even in the United Kingdom, they are using the two initial that they got were maybe the Ox uh, uh, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, but the booster, they're giving is the mRNA vaccine. And India, as we all are aware, from the 10th is going to start, you know, the what they call as protective vaccination for, you know, adults over 60 with comorbid conditions and children in 15 to 17 age group would be eligible for the indigenous co-vaccine. So you have to look okay. at what your circumstances are wherever you are and whatever be the policy in that particular part of the world. So in a nutshell, if I have to boil it down, get vaccinated. Pandemic is still going on for the people who are not vaccinated. But if you're vaccinated, you could be infected, but your chances of getting better is much better compared to non-vaccinated folks. Exactly. Okay. So if a person is eligible, like you mentioned, wherever we are and whatever the rules are. So if a person is eligible for booster shot, is there a particular vaccine they should take or do we have a choice or a say to uh, protect ourselves from Omicron? Um, like I have heard, and I don't know, you are the subject matter expert, but I've heard that if you got Pfizer, take the booster for Moderna, and if you got Moderna, take the, take the booster of Pfizer. So shed some light on that. So, you know, I would suggest that whatever vaccine is available, you should take it. Uh, there are some studies suggesting when you mix and match, there is benefit to it, but the benefit is marginal. So rather than discussing whether one vaccine is better than the other, depending upon, as I said, where one is, uh, one should get whatever vaccine is available. Okay, so bottom line is just get vaccinated. <laughs> um, exactly. So um, if someone had COVID, if someone was positive, uh, you know, some time ago, and they have recovered from COVID-19, um, can they be reinfected uh, with either Delta or Omicron and, and, and so shed some light on that? So that's a very good question. So we have some information on that. So if you've been infected before, say with Delta, then certainly, and even if you are vaccinated, 
then you still uh, can get the Omicron. So there is no cross immunity that if you have had Delta before, it will protect you against Omicron. But there is encouraging data that if you have Omicron, then it does protect you against Delta. So what people are saying is this Omicron, because it is so transmissible, in some ways, people are looking at it as a live attenuated virus that is sort of available throughout the world because it is so transmissible that you know everyone will get infected. You know, for the most part, it's going to be a mild infection, but then one would develop immunity and that would protect us against not only Omicron with subsequent infection, but also against Delta. Okay. Thank you for that. So let's switch gears a little bit. We have been talking about us uh, like uh, like a, a general population, but I want to talk about a little munchkins or the kids. Um, you touched about uh, upon the 12 and 17. So are kids or children more vulnerable to Omicron? So that's a good question. There are two aspects to it. In general, if you look at it, say, in the United States, there is no vaccine available for uh, children up to five years. In India, there is no vaccine available for children up to 15 years. So because mm -hmm. they are not vaccinated, you know, they are at risk for infection. The other big thing that we are seeing is that, you know, we are seeing a higher number of hospital admissions amongst children. As I mentioned, Omicron is primarily affecting the upper airway. And we know that the airways of children are much smaller than the airways of adults. So if they get an infection and it involves the upper airway, they may have greater difficulty in clearing that infection, which an adult would not. Uh, so that is one of the reasons I would suggest both because of lack of vaccination and second, because of uh, this upper airway involvement, it could potentially be more serious in children. So um, for someone like me who doesn't understand medical terms that well, what's an upper airway or, uh, or and the lower airway that you were describing? So when we talk of upper airway, we talk about the nose, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, that's you know part up here. And then it goes into the trachea and then it divides into uh, you know uh, right and left main stem bronchus and then you know the smaller uh, groups of you know exchange which occurs is alveoli so when we talk about lower airway we are predominantly talking about you know lungs so you may have heard you know i have upper airway infection of croup or bronchitis that is not involving the lungs so that's where the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide is taking place so that is why people are presenting with you know their oxygen levels are okay. They're not presenting with pneumonia. So it's mainly an upper airway problem like a bronchitis or uh, sort of upper airway like in children, uh, a serious condition would be like equivalent would be croup. Got it. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. So um, what is what extra precaution should we take to protect ourselves from this variant? You know, uh, the most important thing is uh, prevention. And obviously, wherever you are, whatever is the vaccine requirement, you should get vaccinated uh, whenever it is your turn. That's number one. Number two is, you know, we know that this virus spreads through aerosol as opposed to, say, influenza, which is a droplet uh, uh, infection. So the reason I mentioned that is it's very important uh, about uh, the mask you wear. So the traditional cloth masks are not effective. So let me put it this way. Some mask is better than no mask, but the cloth mask does not provide too much of protection. So if you have to protect yourself, you should get the high quality, the KN95 or N95 masks. Uh, number three, you know, if you have to get together, obviously avoid get togethers, but if you have to, outdoors is better than indoors. So certainly, you know, getting get togethers and parties indoors should be avoided. Uh, social distancing that we are all, all are aware of, and then obviously hand washing. So those are some of the common things one can do to prevent the spread of this uh, infection. 
Okay, so so that's something important. So um, masks are important, but if we can switch the cloth mask to N95 or K95, that's the best. Exactly. Okay. Um, so what is the what is new in the outpatient treatment of COVID-19 variants, including Omicron? O Omicron. So that's a good question. A lot has changed, you know, and now we have uh, treatments that were not available before. Uh, so some of the treatments that are available, uh, one is, you know, there are certain oral antiviral drugs that are now in the market. Uh, the two most important oral ones, one is called molnupiravir and the other is called Paxlovid. So these are both drugs taken by mouth and you have to take it within five days of onset of symptoms. And you have to meet a certain criteria that, you know, either your age or you have some comorbid conditions and you have mild to moderate COVID. So that would prevent hospitalization. So molnipiravir is like 30 to 50% effective. Uh, and Paxlovid from early data suggests close to 90% effective. But I would also tell uh, the viewers that, you know, this should only be taken, uh, you know, with a prescription because these drugs are not for everyone. Molnupiravir should not be taken by people, uh, women who are pregnant or lactating or children below 18 because it can affect uh, the growth of the cartilage. Similarly, Paxlovid should not be taken because it can affect uh, the metabolism of other medications that people are taking. So you have to be cognizant of the fact. The other important thing that we now know is an IV drug called remdesivir uh, that was already available, but now there is data to suggest that if you take it early on within seven days of onset of symptoms for three days, it prevents hospitalization by about 87%. In addition to this, we have something called monoclonal antibodies. Uh, that can be used early on, sooner the better. And uh, so right now we have four monoclonal antibodies and the two, one produced by, uh, you know, Lilly and the other Regeneron are supposed to be not effective against Omicron. There is one monoclonal antibody called Sotrovimab, which is originally produced from the infection SARS-CoV-1 in 2003. So that does not target uh, target the you know the receptor binding domain of the spike protein to be you know exactly precise, uh, so that is why it would be effective against Omicron. So we have a monoclonal antibody also that uh, one can use. So these are some of the things that were not available before, you know, in select patients, uh, which would be very beneficial. So the medication that you were describing, um, these medications are prescription, right? So if we have some issues, then our doctor can prescribe any of these medications? Exactly. The remdesivir has to be given IV, so I don't know the logistics, you know, how one would get three days. Uh, but this was studied, again, if you can have, you know, outpatient infusion centers where you could go every day for three days, then it decreases hospitalization by 87%. That's a big number. That's, yeah, that's a very big number and that's very comforting that we have something which is available which could actually prevent the spread um, of, of the virus and, and stop making people. That's actually really good. So um, Dr. Kutyal, we have some questions. So um, we have some questions through our Facebook Live. So I'm gonna be asking those questions to you. So any information about new variant IHU? So this was a variant, uh first described in France. And uh, actually this came from uh, Africa patient uh, in Cameroon. And uh, so they think that this uh, variant also has uh, a lot of mutations. But again, uh, should we get too worried about it? I would not. I would also say that because we are doing, you know, genome sequencing, not to the extent we should be, we will be seeing variants, but every time we see a new variant does not mean it's going to be worse. So I would point out when the Delta variant came out, we all heard something about, you know, there's a Delta plus variant that is going to be even worse than Delta. And we never heard mm -hmm. anything about that. So I will not say that it is something I'm totally discounting, but uh, the IHU variant, which is reported in France, uh, at this point, you know, we don't think. Uh, again, as I said, the more 
we will be doing uh, the genome sequencing, we will be seeing variants. That's how the virus, you know, lives. It keeps mutating. Uh, so we'll have to see, you know, what the significance of those mutations are. Okay, thank you for that. So another question that we got through our Facebook Live is, um, is any vaccine crossover will happen like two vaccine of COVID shield and one booster do dose of co-vaccine? So, you know, this would be applicable only in India. And my understanding is the government of India has said that you will be getting the same booster dose uh, of the original vaccine. So if you got Covishield, the booster would be Covishield. If you got Covaxin, the booster would be Covaxin. Okay. So with each of these combinations, you know, we have data from say Johnson & Johnson and an mRNA uh, mix and match, which suggests that it is beneficial. I mm -hmm. cannot say that, you know, we have data of patients getting Covishield and Covaxin. So till one sees that data, in general, mix and match is beneficial, but till one sees the data, it would make perfect sense that, you know, one is a vector vaccine and other is an inactivated virus vaccine. So maybe when you get two uh, doses of primary uh, vaccination with Covishield, a booster of Covaxin may boost your neutralizing antibodies to a much higher level. It's possible, but we don't have the data because it's not being studied. Got it. So every time there is a long weekend, every time there is something, we see the cases go up. We had Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year, you know, people, people did get a little relaxed and there were some gatherings that happened. So a general question that what are the chances if people are vaccinated, the vaccinated population, what are the chances of vaccinating vaccinated population getting affected by the variant? You know, again, as I said, because of so many mutations, uh, there is something called as uh, immune escape mechanism in this uh, Omicron. Like I mentioned the data, when I told you about the 52% and 88%, that is preventing hospitalization. There is also data from United Kingdom that 20 weeks after the two doses of uh, uh, vaccination, after 20 weeks, there is 0% protection against symptomatic infection uh, against Omicron. So that puts things in perspective that you are not protected just because you had the two uh, doses of vaccine. Got it. So still self-awareness is the best key and take all the precautions. So um, Dr. Katyal, if you can, um, in, in the beginning of our live, you mentioned the symptoms of, uh, for Omicron. What are the symptoms? If you can repeat those symptoms. So uh, just in case if people are joining us now, so, so they know uh, what to do like a home detection if they have to uh, about this virus. So data from, South Africa, United Kingdom, and here from United States, uh, starting from December to now, uh, it has been published uh, and they have found that if you are affected by the Omicron variant, the most common five symptoms are headache, running nose, sneezing, uh, fatigue, and sore throat. So those are the five common symptoms. And contrasting this with the prior variant, uh, which would present with, you know, high-grade fever and loss of taste, loss of smell is generally not seen with the Omicron variant. So can somebody get COVID and at the same time, can they also get Omicron or is it one over the other? So that would be someone who has both the Delta variant as well as the Omicron variant. You know, I have not seen any reports. I've seen reports of patients getting the Omicron variant, as well as flu, which is called Fluorona. So those cases have been reported in Israel and UK and United States, but I've not seen two concomitant, uh, you know, variants. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that wonderful information. Let me check if we have any more questions. I don't see any more questions coming from Facebook comments. So with that, I am gonna be wrapping up. Well. 
we all heard it from the expert and eGlobal Doctors, which is one complete healthcare platform solution for all your medical related issues and questions. And Maziki Bate, these services are available to you at your fingertips without breaking your bank. eGlobal is LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, Twitter, eGlobal.com eglobaldoctors.com. This recording would be available to you on Facebook and also you can hear it on um, YouTube. So before I let you go, Dr. Katyal, any word of wisdom that you want to share with our listeners and our viewers? I would still say, you know, it's been all doom and gloom uh, since March of 2020, but maybe there is some light at the end of the tunnel with this variant, you know, affecting so many people so people are talking about you know if most of the people will be affected and this would pro provide protection against delta in the united states 95 percent of the infections that we are seeing are omicron so in some ways this will provide the herd immunity that we were talking about not the way we wanted to achieve it but maybe that's how we will achieve it well, there you have it. With that, this is Kunjan signing off. Sayonara. Till we meet again, stay tuned, stay safe, and keep smiling always. Thank you, Dr. Katyal Namaskar. Thank you so much.